Imagine yourself being placed into the MRI machine, but instead of you it's a molecule and instead of MRI machine it's an NMR instrument. And just like MRI can give you a pretty good idea what's going on with our body, NMR can tell you what sort of a molecule we have in front of us. Or in other words, NMR allows us to identify molecules based on how the nuclei of the atoms in our compound interact with the external electromagnetic field. And because this technique looks at the interaction of the nuclei with the magnetic field, it is called the Nuclear Magnetic Resonance, or NMR for short. Hey everyone, my name is Victor, your guide to all things organic chemistry, and in this video we'll take a close look at the NMR and how we use it in organic chemistry to identify the molecules. So grab your cup of coffee and notebook to write down the important parts, hit the like button for good luck on the test, and let's get started. Well, first of all, what exactly does the NMR see? In short, the NMR sees the nuclei with the odd mass numbers. And while there are quite a few nuclei like this, as organic chemists we are only interested in handful of those, namely we are interested in hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, fluorine and phosphorus. While the hydrogen and carbon are going to be our core for the NMR spectroscopy, the rest are just going to be some fancy variants that we are not going to be typically looking at within the scope of a regular organic chemistry. And without going too deep into the physics and quantum mechanics of how the nuclei interact with the magnetic field, let's just say that if we have a nucleus with the odd mass number, we can align its spin either with the magnetic field or against the magnetic field. And since it takes more more energy to go against the flow rather than align yourself with the field, the NMR instrument measures the energy that it takes to flip the spin of the nuclei. And this energy does depend on the chemical environment of our nuclei. In this video we'll focus on the H NMR and the C NMR as those are the two core techniques for the structure determination. We'll start with the C NMR first. So as C NMR sees carbons in our molecule, let's look at a simple example. Here I have an acetone molecule, which contains three carbons. From the perspective of the NMR, these two carbons are identical to each other. They are both CH3s and they are both connected to the same carbonyl group. We call atoms like that chemically equivalent and we say that they have the same environment. This also means that they will be indistinguishable in the NMR's eyes. However, this carbon in the middle is different from the other two. Looking at the CNMR spectrum for the acetone molecule, we can see two signals on it. One here at 206 ppm and another one at 30 ppm. We also see a small signal from the solvent at around 77 ppm. This is a chloroform signal, which is a commonly used in NMR as a solvent, so you'll be seeing this guy around a lot and can always discard that signal. And before we go further, I want to mention that the NMR uses the ppm scale. While it isn't dependent from the instrument that we use, it is dependent on the type of the NMR spectrum we are looking at. For the carbon NMR, we typically see signals from 0 to about 240 ppm, while for the hydrogen NMR, we typically see signals from 0 to about 14. Most instructors will label which spectrum is which on the exam, but on an off chance that they are not labeled, you can easily deduce it by just looking at the numbers on the x-axis. We also see that the signals from our carbons are sitting in the different regions of the spectrum. The signals on the left side of our spectrum are de-shielded and we'll commonly refer to that part of the spectrum as downfield. The signals on the right side of the spectrum are shielded and will refer to those as upfield. An important thing to remember here is that the electronegative atoms and electron withdrawing groups de-shield our carbons and move their signals to the left. And that's why our orange carbon is all the way to the left at 206 ppm as it is right next to the electronegative oxygen in the molecule. Here is another example. In this butanone molecule, I have a carbon of the carbon at 209 ppm, then I have the CH2 group at 36 ppm, one methyl at 29 and another one at 7 ppm. And you might be wondering why the CH3 groups here are all of a sudden not identical like in the previous case. Well, if we pay close attention to what those CH3 groups are attached to, we'll see that one of them, the one on the left, the green one, is directly connected to the carbonyl, while the other one on the right 
side, the pink one, that one is connected to the CH2 group. Because of that, they are no longer equivalent. Equivalent groups will have identical connectivity throughout the molecule. Always pay very close attention to how groups and atoms are interconnected to each other in the molecule. If the connectivity is not the same, then the groups are not equivalent. Now, when it comes to the position of our signals in the spectrum, the carbon of the carbonyl is at 209 ppm because that carbon is directly connected to the electronegative oxygen, while at the same time the pink carbon is the least deshielded or most upfield, if you like, because it is the furthest away from the oxygen. However, you shouldn't just rely on the guesswork when it comes to the positioning of the signals in the CNMR. You should become very comfortable with the CNMR reference table. As always, I don't recommend you just sit down and memorize the whole thing. You'll just end up with a huge mess in your head, but rather keep it handy as a reference table at your disposal. And with practice, you'll memorize most of those numbers anyways. Now, moving on to the hydrogen NMR, we are going to see a lot of similarities with the CNMR. However, HNMR adds a few layers of complexity and information that we can use to determine uh, the structure of our molecule. So let's look at this molecule over here. Just like in the case of the C NMR or carbon NMR, in the uh, H NMR we are going to be looking at the equivalence of different groups of atoms, hydrogens in this case. The pink groups are equivalent because they are both connected to the same carbon. Let's call them group A. One thing that is important to keep in mind that unlike carbons, we typically have way more hydrogens in organic molecules, so we'll often have many hydrogens in each group. In this case, we have six hydrogens in the group A. Next, group B only has one hydrogen. Group C has two hydrogens. And finally, the group D has three hydrogens in it. Notice that group A and group D are non-equivalent due to their connectivity inside of this molecule. We are going to refer to the number of hydrogens in the group as the integration. It is called integration quite literally because we are going to take the H and MR spectrum and we are going to integrate the area under the peak's curve, which for the NMR corresponds to the number of hydrogens in the group. It's pretty handy, I would say. Another important phenomenon that we are going to see for the H and MR that we didn't look at in the case of the CNMR is so-called splitting, multiplicity or coupling. Essentially, we are going to look at the number of neighboring hydrogen atoms for each group and see how many of those neighbors we have, and then we are going to use the n plus 1 rule to find the number of peaks in each signal. Honestly, it's easier to explain with an example. The group A, in this case, only has one neighbor, that is our group B. In turn, group B sees both A and C, so the total number of neighbors that we are going to have for group B is going to be 8. Group C then can only see the hydrogen B, meaning that we only have one neighbor for that group. And finally, group D has no neighbors. Well, I mean, technically it has an oxygen, but since oxygen doesn't have any hydrogens on it, we are going to say that uh, group D has no neighbors. Which means that now we can determine the multiplicity of our signals using the n plus 1 formula, where n is the number of neighbors for each group, so we are going to have a doublet for group A, Nonet for group B, doublet for group C, and finally singlet for group D. And here how it looks like on an actual spectrum for the diethyl ether. Each of the CH2 groups that we have here has three neighbors in the form of the methyl group, so it gives us a quartet. While the methyl groups see the CH2s as neighbors, where we have two hydrogens giving us a triplet. Another curious thing about the splitting patterns is that the fact that the peaks are not the same height, which can be easily estimated using the Pascal's triangle. This is a well-known mathematical device uh, where the middle numbers are obtained by taking a sum of the outer numbers from the previous row. Look it up if you have never seen it before, it's kind of cool. So the singlet will only have one peak. The doublet will have both peaks with the same height. Triplet's middle peak will be twice as high as the outside peaks. Quartet, however, the inner peak there, well, the two inner peaks for the quartet, are going to be three times the height of our outside ones. And so on for quintet, sextet, septet, 
octet and nonet. The first four are the most common splitting patterns, so we are typically going to be abbreviating them by the first letter. The rest are typically abbreviated as multiplet. I also want to point out that uh, since the intensity of the inner peaks grow exponentially, sometimes we won't be able to count all the peaks for the multiplets. So in the actual spectrum that you may see on your test, a nonet, for example, which should contain 9 peaks, may appear as a septet, aka having only 7 peaks, simply because the outer peaks are so weak in comparison that we are just going to be essentially uh, not seeing them, they're going to be invisible. Also, one other thing to keep in mind, that groups that are capable of hydrogen bonding, like OH and NH, they typically do not split with their neighbors, and they do not get split from the neighbors. So, for instance, here is the spectrum of ethanol. Group A here sees the CH2, so it's a triplet. Group B only sees the hydrogens uh, on the nearby carbon and not the hydrogen on the OH group, thus it's going to be a quartet. And finally, the group C, which is our OH, doesn't see anything, so it's a singlet. And another annoying feature of the OH and NH groups is that they can appear at different places in the spectrum depending on the sample concentration, impurities, solvent we use, etc. And talking about the positions in the spectrum, or in other words, the chemical shift, you should also have a reference table for the H NMR, just like what you have for the C NMR. So to recap what we have learned today, Today, carbon NMR sees the carbons, while the hydrogen NMR sees the hydrogens in your molecule. The number of unique signals in the spectrum corresponds to the number of unique groups, either those are hydrogens or carbons, that we have in our molecule. The chemical shift depends on the chemical environment of our atoms. Electron withdrawing groups and electronegative elements de-shield our group and move their signal to the left side of the spectrum. Integration is related to the number of hydrogens in the group, and we are only going to be doing the integration for the hydrogen NMR, and we don't integrate the C NMR. And finally, our hydrogens can see the neighbors and show it via the coupling or splitting patterns. And we can calculate the splitting pattern that we should see using the n plus 1 rule and the relative intensities of those peaks using the Pascal's triangle. Thank you for watching! If you've learned something new today, please give this video a like and tell me about your first NMR experience in the comments below. I love reading your comments, and your likes and shares mean a world to me. Subscribe to the channel for the daily organic chemistry updates if you haven't done so yet, watch this video next, and I will see you tomorrow!